7. William Torrey Harris The State and the True Self of Man William Torrey Harris, 1835-1908, whose administrative work in St. Louis from 1857 to 1880 and whose term of office as U.S. Commissioner of Education from 1889 to 1906, placed him in strategic positions of influence, added to those positions his own intellectual abilities to exercise a long and decisive influence on education in the United States. Merle Curty, in his assessment of the life and work of Harris, named him the conservator, and in a sense this title has merit to it, Harris stemmed the tide of much radicalism in education, that is, political and economic radicalism, and prevented the early and more extensive triumph of progressive education through the work of Colonel Parker, whose influence Harris, as the decisive philosophic thinker of the day in education, helped stem and reshape. The influence of Harris was extensive in both education and philosophy, and his imprint large on such diverse persons as Nicholas Murray Butler and John Dewey. Leidecker reports that when St. Louis was once mentioned to Henry Bergson, that philosopher immediately responded, Oh, that's the city Dr. Harris made famous by his great insight into philosophy. Both through the Journal of Speculative Philosophy, which he founded, when only 32 and edited through 22 volumes, and through educational media, Harris made a profound impact on the thinking of his day. When his death was noted at the National Educational Association NEA meetings of July 2nd to the 8th, 1910 in Boston, James W. Greenwood, in his memorial address, declared, His rank is among the world's greatest men, from such an eminence, the name of William Torrey Harris has passed into obscurity in other than educational circles, and even there his work has been superseded by that of Dewey and others, and his outlook, to a large degree, bypassed. In spite of this fact, the importance of Harris is very real, and his temporary eclipse is in part due to his conservatism in certain areas, aspects of his work which go against the grain with men who are in other respects his followers. The key to both the neglect of Harris and to his continuing influence is in his Hegelian philosophy. Let us examine first a common evaluation of Harris's Hegelianism as expressed by Curti. The Hegelian philosophy which Harris made the basis of all his social and educational thinking possessed the virtue of being thoroughly optimistic and idealistic in character. It infused the world with a divine purpose and endowed the individual with a noble and immortal destiny. At the same time, it justified the existing order and authorities by declaring that whatever is, is an inevitable stage in the enfolding of objective reason, or the world spirit, and is therefore right. The decisive influence of Hegel on Harris must be recognised immediately, and its continuing influence noted. As numerous writers have observed, shortly before his death, Harris said, 1908, I have now commenced the reading of Hegel's Philosophy of History for the seventeenth time and I shall get more out of it at this reading than at any previous one. But this Hegelian influence was not quite the conservative influence Curti believed it to be, and Harris's conservatism was more apparent than real. Harris, as a philosopher, refused to permit the overvaluation of schools and of education. As McCluskey noted, he rejected Spencer's idea that each child should be brought to school to learn the art of complete living. While on occasion Harris slipped into the contemporary and continuing belief in education as a panacea, he usually spoke sharply against such temper. As he observed at the 1885 NEA meeting at Saratoga Springs, New York, 
It is a serious error to confine the definition of education in such a way as to make it include the province of the school only, and not the various educative influences of the four cardinal institutions of civilization, family, civil society, states and church. The school is not one of the cardinal institutions of civilization, but is a supplementary special institution designed to reinforce one or more of the cardinal institutions in their educative functions. The institution to be reinforced depended on the particular culture. It was this element in Harris which has been the real offence to many educators since. Harris made himself even more clear at Chicago in 1887, stating forcefully, There are many items in which this school must be on its guard, lest it be an aggressor or even a transgressor. Since the school was not to be a determining agency, but a supplementary special institution to reinforce the cultural agencies, it had to reflect that culture rather than attempt to mould it. Thus, Harris, while he was personally opposed to religion in quote-unquote public schools and clearly for the separation of religious instruction from public schools, could also affirm in conformity to his principles Were the community homogeneous in its profession of faith, dogmatic religious instruction could still properly remain in the school. There were times, indeed, when Harris fell into the messianic language of educators, as two utterances give particular evidence. In 1892, in speaking to the NEA on 20 years' progress in education, he saw its meaning in thoroughly religious terms. In these lines of progress, we see the development of the missionary spirit of Christianity, which goes out into the highways and byways and seeks out the maimed, the halt and the spiritually blind and brings them into the house of the Father. Again in 1893 at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago, July the 25th to the 28th, in the Report of the Committee of Arrangements for the International Congress of Education, Harris spoke of the fact that the central place of school education among the great regenerating movements of modern civilization is obvious. In our system of governments, we must never cut loose from the people. The object of the school managers should be twofold, to improve the schools and to educate public opinion in favour of improvement. It would be wrong to attach any importance to these remarks, however. Harris was successful in part because he reflected both intelligently, philosophically and fairly the culture of his day and did so as his duty and privilege. The key to this amenability to diverse opinions, an amenability which made Harris so popular and powerful a figure in his day, was his Hegelian philosophy. Rather than being productive of conservatism, as Curdie believed, it was productive of a thoroughgoing pragmatism, and an idealistic pragmatism at that. The Hegelianism of Hegel led to the absolutization of a particular social order. The Hegelianism of Harris led to the relativization of every social order and philosophy in terms of a continuous process and was thus the fountainhead of pragmatism. Harris was, in a very real sense, a more consistent Hegelian than Hegel, and, as a brilliant mediator between systems, was capable of abstracting a synthesis out of ostensibly contrary systems without making his synthesis more than a step towards the next manifestation of process in time. Whereas Hegel and Marx arbitrarily crystallised the process into a final order, Harris consistently held to the process. In terms of their finality, Hegel and Marx could turn intolerantly on the process with the perspective of a final truth. For Harris, the goal was ethical freedom, the triumph of man's freedom as man, 
a sufficiently general ideal to make possible its continuous development in a continuous process. There being no absolute order for Harris, and a continuous process and development always manifesting progress, Harris could face the future both with optimism and also with a certain detachment from the entire process. All things manifested a partial truth and none a final truth, so that the wise man saw the relative nature of each particular and approached it pragmatically. The Hegelian idealism of Harris was thus the basis of his pragmatism. The Hegelian foundation of the pragmatism of James and Dewey has been studied. The relationship is even more pronounced in Harris. What was the educational significance of this pragmatic Hegelianism of Harris? Because Harris believed in progress, he fought against the primitivism and return to nature tendencies common to many educators under the influence of Rousseau and Pestalozzi. Such a movement which he was ready to appreciate as a corrective to cramped formalism was nevertheless in error in reducing man to the level of nature. Harris drew a distinction between nature in general and human nature. Human nature being something which only exists as a product of culture. All Petzolotzian stress on spontaneous activity is destructive of the cultural activity which alone makes for civilization. It puts a premium on caprice, which destroys the work of one moment by that of the next. It is only self-consistent activity that can be free. What is done through caprice will be controlled by accident. The state of nature and the state of culture, however, must not be falsely separated, for they are antitheses. And all true systems of education must mediate between them. The ideal of free men in a free state cannot be realized by the reduction of men to a lower state of nature. Accordingly, textbook education is no blind traditionalism, but a respect for the highest attainment of human nature and a resolve to begin with the best of the past in order to advance to still higher culture and civilization. The textbook thus serves to liberate man from the past, from tradition, from himself, and is the true basis of all truly progressive education, which is not a product of that confusion sometimes characterizing Rousseau, whereby nature is elevated over culture. That this position was no empty verbiage with Harris was apparent in his sharp remarks during the course of a discussion on all false confidence in contemporary knowledge, learning or science. We forget that all education and all knowledge and all we gain of knowledge is going from the known to the unknown. The danger is that we leave the factor, the unknown, out of the question and wander around among the known on the hither side, on the greatest point is to keep the unknown as far out of the way as possible, and when the child approaches it, throw him off, put in soft things, words and smuggle the knowledge into the scholar. This is a way of teaching him that the unknown is really something familiar, and that it is not any work for him to know it. If he will just repeat it over a few of the terms he already knows, he will find himself in possession of the knowledge of the unknown. In that way, we make education seem a simple thing. I think it is too simple and too easy. It seems to me that error is committed in the direction in which most of the discussion went this morning. For Harris, education has as its purpose the preservation of civilization, not of its evolution, growth or decay, for the causes of these lie far deeper than in a system of education. Education is hindered by the would-be social reformer and by all men who refer to education things entirely beyond its scope. Education, as concedes, has a twofold purpose. First, initiation into the practice of what belongs to civilized man 
and second, an invitation into the ideas that lie at the basis of that practice. The first is moral education, and the second, intellectual education. Because education cannot be a return to nature, and because it is an initiation into the past in terms of the future, it cannot be conceived of in terms of the individual in isolation from past and present society. Man is not man in isolation from man and in terms of nature in general, but rather in terms of society, in terms of culture and civilization. To negate that societal aspect of man in preference to an anarchistic concept of man and nature is to destroy education. Now, it is evidently a great mistake a heresy in education to suppose that the unaided individual can develop into a rational being except through participation in the labours of the human race. It is a heresy in education to suppose that education is anything else than this initiation of the individual into the wisdom which mankind has accumulated. In looking to that past into which man is to be initiated, Harris's orientation was classical rather than Christian, and the embryology of modern civilization is to be found in these wonderful peoples of ancient Greece and Rome. Since the immature mind of youth is not capable of making a wise choice, the wisdom of his instructors must be his guide, for they know the wants of the pupil and the best mode of supplying them. Paris, personally not a Christian in any accepted sense, strove always to be fair and honest in reflecting the prevailing culture and strove to avoid any leading in such matters. Nevertheless, he was unable in choosing the process into which the people was initiated to avoid a basically religious choice and to create a religious framework for education which was other than Christian. Education viewed thus as an initiation or baptism into a process, and initiation is, like baptism, a basically religious concept, meant initiation into a culture and society whose supplementary instrument the school was. This society is an organism and has a self, even as man does. Man's individual self or ego is hemmed in by limitations, qualitative and quantitative. In his institutional lives, man organically becomes a series of giant selves, each one formed in the general image of man and having its heads, its hands, its deliberative power, its will power to execute with. In his giant self, man himself, finite, becomes infinite, the individual. Limitations are cancelled or annulled through participation, each man participating in the life of all men. Thus, while man's goal is infinitely reflected self-activity, and education seeks to further the independence, freedom and self-help of the individual, this goal can only be attained as man joins his finite self to organisms which make him in effect infinite. This is therefore an individualism which exalts the collective whole. Participation in the whole is an essentially religious experience and is characterised as vicarious suffering. Young girls ought to read the daily newspapers because they can therein enter into this mystical experience of participation. Mounted, as it were, on a high throne, each man can behold his greater self, the self of humanity in the aggregate, with all its nations and peoples, under all climes and in every stage of development. He can behold this stupendous revelation of human nature moving onwards towards its goal. The divinest fact in society is that of vicarious suffering. Each human being participates in the wisdom of the race and learns through the successes and failures of others. What one does in this world is not alone for himself, but likewise for his fellow men. 
Participation is the greatest fact of human spiritual life, and our religion makes vicarious suffering the supreme condition of salvation. It is not, we see alone, the fact that the good suffer for the wicked, but in this world providence has decreed that the wicked vicariously help their good fellow men by the spectacle of their own disaster. The broader the view, the truer the vision. The answer is thus very clear-cut. Young girls ought to read the daily newspapers as a religious experience. Thus, while the school was not divinized by Harris, the processes of history and participation therein were divinized. The process of history is Allah, and the newspaper is Muhammad the Prophet. Certainly modern man, by virtue of all his immersion in evil and disaster, should consider himself greatly blessed if Harris is right. The antinomians of Paul's day said, Let us sin that grace may abound. Romans 6 1. In Harris's version, Let us behold sin that grace may abound. It is not surprising, therefore, that Harris saw the three characteristic instruments of modern civilization as the real road the daily newspaper, and the common school, and rejoiced in that fact. All three were instruments of participation in the great mass of humanity and furthered the binding of the finite self to society, the state, and other institutional and infinite selves of man. Man is truly man, not so much under God as in humanity and in organic relationship thereto. Thus Hegelianism leads to mass man, whether in the dictatorship of the proletariat in Marx's version, or in the democratic society of John Dewey in this respect, an apt follower of Harris. It should be noted that Harris, by his faith in the inevitability of progress through process, his confidence that time and flux moved steadily forward, associated that triumph of mass man with the triumph of freedom, intelligence, and virtue. For him, the progress of democracy meant also the inevitable progress of liberty, good character, and intellectual and cultural advance. Thus, he could say without hesitation in his response at the 1890 NEA meeting in St. Paul, Minnesota, The nation that proclaims itself a government of all the people by all the people, a government of universal freedom, is necessarily founded on virtue and intelligence. There is no understanding the vast areas of presupposition underlying subsequent pragmatism apart from this basic faith. All the benefits of past cultural attainment accrue to the present without loss. Christianity may disappear or be superseded, but all its advantages will remain without diminution as the inheritance of man. Such were the implications and assumptions of this Hegelian concept of society. Since the constant tendency of the Hegelian process is to effect a synthesis, it follows, therefore, that synthesis is the continued goal of societal relationships, and order and unity are emphasised above all else in such systems. This note was not lacking in Harris, as his idea of morals very clearly shows. I have heard the protest that we are neglecting moral education in the schools. I think there is a confusion here between moral philosophy and moral education. We pretend to try to teach the intellect and endeavour to secure good behaviour and not moral education. We hear a good deal about morals not being taught in the schools. Is there a school that does not teach good behaviour? This is considered the basis of all things. Order is heaven's first law. Now, every teacher teaches exercise, punctuality, self-restraint, regularity and industry in order that the whole may produce something. There is an additional restraint. The pupil is met with the arm of the teacher. These certainly are commendable virtues, but a man limited to these 
is hardly a moral man in any Christian sense. Order may be heaven's first law in a Hegelian heaven, but the Shorter Catechism teaches that man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever, a very different and more inclusive standard. Harris most certainly believed in individualism, a common emphasis in his day, but his was not the individualism of others. In that, it called for vicarious participation as the goal of individualism. As he declared in Charleston, South Carolina in 1900, I close with my thesis, assumed at the beginning, namely, that our movement toward individualism is possible only in connection with a reverse movement from the individual toward what is universal, and the attainment of this by means of culture, by means of the increase of education of all kinds, especially of higher education. This universalism means, in part, vicarious experience, and vicarious experience has as its purpose the furtherance of individualism. Higher education in particular furthers this kind of individualism. It was natural, therefore, for Harris to see this goal best fulfilled in this state school, with its democratic nature and experiences. And Harris declared himself to be in hearty agreements with Horace Mann and James G. Carter concerning the right of the state to educate at public expense. His definition of slavery and freedom is also revealing. If the individual exists for the social whole alone and is not endowed with the beneficence of the whole, we have slavery. When we look at the individual as receiving the gift of the whole and the whole handing to it what all has produced, we have freedom. This indeed is freedom after the manner of Soviet Russia. It is freedom only in terms of production and consumption. Certainly, Harris would have included in the gift of the whole cultural factors and personal liberties, but if such liberties are gifts of society or of the state, then man has no true liberty and only sufferance. For Harris, without any qualifications, whatever it gives to the mind a larger view increases individuality. For Harris, the state exercises directive power upon the individual, and assumes the functions of a willpower like him, but the state always assumes the control of the individual for the benefits of the social unit. Against this social unit he has no substantial existence. Civil society, the most important phase of which is the organisation of man's industry in the form of division of labour, is the area of individuality not the state. Civil society seems to be an organisation of the social unit for the use of the individual, while the state is the social unit in which the individual exists, not for himself, but for the use of that unit, the state. In civil society, the whole exists for each. In the state, each exists for the whole. Harris earnestly believed that the self-determination of the individual is the object of all government. But his conception of this, in his own words, was that the great end of all government is the elevation of mere individuals to the dignity of self-directive persons, the concentration of the realised products of all in each. This, in itself, was a commonly affirmed ideal, but Harris joined to it his divinized process, a state which was a mystical entity and an organism without any fear that statism could overrule the victories and liberties of the past and the present. How startling his conception was is an apparent in his discussion of the French Revolution, that mainspring of modern statism. For Harris, the French Revolution and the Reign of Terror taught emphatically that Mere individualism is no guarantee of freedom. There came to be an insight into the necessity of the government, the institution of the state, as the guarantee of the life and liberty of the citizen. The 
ideal nature of man gets realized in his institutions. Man's fulfillment is that institutional rather than God-centered, social rather than individual. The relation of the individual to this larger self incarnated in institutions is that of obedience to authority. The institution, which is a social whole, is one of its forms, prescribes to the individual, and he obeys. For the child who leaves the circle of the family, for the larger circle of the democratic school, it does mean an estrangement and an isolation, but this must be seen as an emancipation from the immediate sway to the distant, larger and more important. It is a process of correcting the judgment of the individual as to what his true self is and as to what is of permanent value in human endeavour. Clearly, the implication is very obviously that the family is a lesser order, the larger institutions having more mature and emancipating influence. The various economic and political opinions of Harris, together with his readiness to accept the outcome of the Spanish-American War and Empire as a forward step, are now unpopular with educators, but they are far from basic to his position. Instead of being the conservator, Harris was, in many respects, a great transmitter, giving to educators a concept of the state as an organism in terms of which man must find his true self and fulfilment. R. Freeman Butts, in a passing comment on Harris's influence as a philosopher, has been most aware of his significance. The Hegelian and idealistic emphasis upon the organic relationship between the society and the individual, which was promulgated through the Journal of Speculative Philosophy by Harris and others, and in Harris's numerous addresses, led, together with the doctrines of evolution and pragmatism, to the educational philosophy of John Dewey. Others had prepared the way with their concepts of education. Harris gave to philosophers and educators the doctrine of society and the state as the true self of man.